Dr. Ambedkar, do you think democracy is going to work in India? No. Except in a formal sense, if you want. What do you mean? Well, well, you know, I mean the paraphernalia of democracy. Full period elections, prime ministers, and so on and so on. Well, but elections are very important. No. Elections are important provided they produce really good men. So, and democracy will not work. For the simple reason, we have got a social structure which is totally incompatible with parliamentary democracy. What do you, you mean that it's based on equality, inequality, or it is based on inequality? Yeah, so, so yes, I mean, in Ambedkar, the, 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 the role of the magistrate is, is there, absolutely. Like I pointed out in the last talk, that uh, the, 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 um, the question of, uh, of fundamental rights is posed from the side of the state. That the side of the state, uh, fundamental rights come rights are fundamental rights are the gift of the state he says and the reason he does that is clear that uh, the state in a sense is is not a corporation like different communities and corporations exist in India who seem to privatize the notion of rights within a corporate communitarian <coughs> communal uh, perspective the state is um, is in that sense the people in Ambedkar uh, at that level but at the same time, he does point out that the people can also be a kind of multitudinous anarchic uh, idea. It can also be a corrupt idea because if the people are degenerate without Dhamma, then the people can also be a corrupt idea. So as such, there is nothing, nothing like the people are good. You're right. You're completely right. So you see, that's what I'm calling politics of the subject. So it is not that politics of the subject is without the magistrate side, but the the, it is not that through the magistrate side, through the, through the civic constitutional uh, habituation, the subject is formed in the last phase of Ambedkar's life, of, from which this book comes. Here, Ambedkar is actually raising the possibility of the, the, the subject who can think through the Dhamma or with the Dhamma, or Dhamma is the, is the force of thought. So in that sense, it is not at the same level as magistrate. That's all I'm saying. But yes, of course, the magistrate can come in, in situations. So Ambedkar is not a, he's not an armchair philosopher, even if armchair philosophers also do great work. Ambedkar is definitely always thinking of situations. He's a jur jur juristic thinker also. So he's always thinking of real situations and what to do about those situations. But, you see, Ambedkar never says that in a situation, let us simply look at what are the practical administrative magist magistrate options. He will say, what must be the principle for a magistrate to act on? This is Ambedkar's absolutely rigorous method. For every organ of the state, it must not be something done purely as the reflex of the state. Even the state he is granting must is must have must be open to thinking of principles or thinking through principles. But it's not the other way around, which is very you know, which is a kind of Marxist uh, thinking, which is that the state is already completely um, hijacked <coughs> by bourgeois principles. Hence, there is no point in 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 
uh, looking at the state through principles. State must either be completely rejected or state must be instrumentalized like Lenin did with dictatorship of the proletariat. Either of the two things. But with Ambedkar, that is not really the way he looks at the state. He says, this, in the specific situations that the state must deal with, we must ask for that specific situation, what is the correct principle to be adopted? And in a way, the constitution is a laying down of those principles. So I always say that with the constitution, the jurisprudence of the constitution must be thought about, not simply the constitution. Yeah, that's one thing. But that does not mean that Dhamma is at the same level as a discourse and as a philosophical discourse, discourse particularly as the magistrate. That, I think, should be yeah, kept in mind. So yeah, thank you. So the first point is that his, the due is influence on him. Now, uh, because on the one hand there is so much material of this influence that it actually is diffused over Ambedkar's works. Um, Annihilation of caste it has so such strong reminiscences of Dewey, particularly the part where Ambedkar talks about the most, for me the most beautiful part talks about what he calls new community, new common emotion, which is precisely what I also talked about. Dalit is a new common emotion, uh, uh, a new community, not a community in the sense of identity, but community in the sense of politics, uh, but localized through the work of community, which are untouchable communities. Uh, th this whole idea of the new community as, as a new potential for a kind of, of, of transmitting or communicating an egalitarian thought clearly comes from Dewey, uh, it, because there are literally his reading of Dewey is evident in many of these ideas. Uh, so yes, that, but I don't think that that uh, that particular influence is any less with his last part. If anything, it is even more so. So actually, the difficulty is not so much with the inf the, the influence. The influence is there, and the ins I would rather call it inspiration uh, is there. But it is the other kind of thing which we say this as a matter of, you know, common perception is that and as a matter of consensus. Dewey or any philosopher like Dewey as a pragmatist. I have not, I'm not a scholar of Dewey, but usually American thinkers like William James, John Dewey, Richard Rorty later, they are the ones who are more or less clubbed within the pragmatist school. Now the pragmatist school can be seen in two ways. One is that the pragmatist school is uh, actually uh, which thinks of, uh, of uh, human, human situations, society, <coughs> not through absolute metaphysical categories, but through a very specific um, ethical parameters. So pragmatism also has a strong uh, ethical dimension. But uh, unfortunately, uh, pragmatism also has another connotation, uh, which uh, this dewey uh, Ambedkar relationship sometimes suffers from. And that connotation is pragmatism as a lowering of theoretical stakes. As if Dewey was a philosopher who was not a, a, a he was not of the same philosophical magnitude as a Hegel or, you know, as a Marxist uh, philosopher, Lukács. To me, that is not the, the best way of looking at uh, the history of philosophy. Uh, uh, to me, philosophy must be looked at also <coughs> through either the prism or the, rather the, 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 the window of a certain uh, uh, Again, a certain egalitarian, <coughs> a certain egalitarian openness to the fact that philosophy, th 
thinks about the principles of thinking about situations. Philosophy uh, does not think about the uh, the more or less of of those principles. That, that, that's a problem with with how American pragmatist philosophy has been received. That it is as if it is it is philosophical, but it is a lighter philosophy. It is a more situated situational philosophy rather than an absolute philosophy. But Dewey thinks, if not more, uh, sorry, if not less, uh, even more through principles. The principles are pragmatist. That is true. That is absolutely true. But that doesn't make the principle any less rigorous. I'm you're not saying it, but that's a general way of thinking about the Ambedkar Dewey relationship. That Ambedkar uh, was uh, through Dewey uh, more communitarian or more ethical, and also partly individualistic in this uh, in the sense of um, in the sense of looking at the individual as a as a free being. And then Ambedkar was also radical in in some other respects, whether through his influence of a certain kind of socialism or Marxism or influence of other sources and so on and so forth. I don't think that is the best way of thinking about Ambedkar in an overall way. Big, I mean, a book recently has come out, which has some good articles, The Radical in Ambedkar. Yeah, uh, Tentum Day uh, and the other person who was uh, right. Uh, they have edited. Now, apart from the article, think about the title. A friend of mine, you know, uh, um, said something very, very precise. He said, "The Radical in Ambedkar." That's what this book is called. Would you ever bring out a book called "The Radical in Marx"? No, because you would say Marx is the measure of radicality. This is the pragmatist fallacy. You know, this is the pragmatist. So to me, the point is not which is which part is pragmatist. How point is to affirm all of it, but all of it is not one. All of it is, of course, heterogeneous. All of it could also have contradictions, but in that contradictory, contradictory ambedkarism, ambedkar's thought, if one is interested at all, must be affirmed. So to that extent, I don't see one phase as this or the next. But of course, uh, you're right. And Annihilation of Caste, I think, is the best text to take this up, which is due his influence, particularly with regard to this central idea of the common uh, emotion. So, yeah. Ah, the second question, which is of great interest to me. So, I think you're completely right. It's a matter of, on the one hand, bewilderment at the ordinary analytical level. That how come when economically everything is so bad, it is on economic basis, at least one hypothesis, hypothesis is, that people have voted rather than on communitarian basis. Yes, if at all, why? How? What sense does one make? Clearly, it is to use what uh, you know the term you used yesterday. It is a more subjective. It is a more subjective success, not an objective success. So obviously, objective indicators don't uh, match at all. Neither growth rates, nor numbers of farmers who kill themselves, nor famine conditions, and so much else that is going on. People dying of of uh, of medical uh, uh, epidemics and so on, not objective, but subjectively, there is some success. It seems to me. Now, the example that I have for this subjective success comes from the the episode with the greatest obvious disastrous consequences for practical lives of people, which is demonetization. No, but you see, that is the point. That is the point. I have written about it. My, and of course, one can't demonstrate these things, it's just a theory, but let me state the theory. It seems to me that people are rational here. Why would people still vote for the very, for the very source from which such a thing comes? They would do it for only one reason, which is the same as what I call the Stockholm Syndrome. Why does one fall in love with a hijacker? It's a real problem, but people have. This has happened. There's, there's only one logical reason. When someone determines your life to that extent that he or she hijacks you, then the only way of escaping is through her, through him. If someone can do something so overwhelmingly decisive as demonetization, then the only way of saving yourself, given that there is nothing else, is through that very person. 
So it's a kind of love of the hijacker. <laughs> but it is a subjective idea. So clearly, the moment you get a sense of another movement, then this thing, so in a hijacked situation, if the, actually you feel there is a chance of escape, then you will escape. You will not stay with the hijacker. But that alternative must be there. In the present conjuncture, possibly no such alternative subjectively has triggered that kind of possibility that people can, you know, say, okay, we are going to now vote or whatever, do else, some, do something elsewhere. But that does not mean that cannot happen. So to that extent, X election or A or B election is not the end of politics nor the measure of politics. But yes, it is an occasion for thinking about politics and not weeping. Or weeping, thinking while weeping. Uh, this is how I look at it. So that question, second question, definitely interests me a lot. Because there is a clearly a contradiction there. You're right. Well, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Good repetition versus bad change. But I think the, the question of choosing between good repetition and bad change is also a question from within the revolutionary perspective. If it is, if you are, if one uh, tries to choose between a good revolution and a bad, uh, sorry, a bad revolution and a good conservatism, then probably there is a problem. Because revolution in itself is not a guarantee for things getting better. But revolution is a kind of risk, it's a kind of wager, about which you are not sure what the consequences will be, but you do know or you do uh, feel the force that this is something which is going to lead to something. So consequences will open up. In that sense, it's a particular type of event, the revolution. But that does not mean revolution in itself Guarantees happiness. Revolution is a, an opportunity for thinking that happiness is possible. Though the definition of happiness can of course be something which can be different in different contexts. Now, Ambedkar when he, when, he, when, he, when, he, when he speaks of ritual in the sense of a new ritual, civic ritual, I mean he is not the only one. Rousseau was a thinker of civic rituals, civic gods in democracy, in, in the new the new form of the state. Uh, Rousseau did that. Ambedkar, in a way, is very close to Rousseau in this respect. Um, there, I, like I said last time, Ambedkar is doing two things at the same time. And it is not a very easy balance to sustain. Uh, he is, on the one hand, definitely with Buddhism, uh, but also earlier, and Buddhism was always there, of course, uh, opening himself to a historical change of which he cannot be the master. But at the same time, the very possibility of the change must be raised. I mean, must be brought into the picture. So, the untouchable person cannot be someone who is completely locked into his or her uh, condition forever. Uh, in that sense, the possibility that change is possible. And, I mean, something is said in the caste in India, that castes look like they have been for forever. But actually, it is a historical structure. <coughs> it's a mystery that why do they look like that? Let's try and crack that mystery. That's what he said. So, in a sense, that historicity of of of, uh, of society or societal conditions is something that he was uh, very very strongly in that sense very close to materialistic thinking. No doubt about it. Uh, that is one side. But it is at the same time you're right. He was also not someone who was an anarchist at all and not even a communist in the usual sense, who would give himself up to the event, who would kind of abandon himself to the event. No, while the event of change is something that must be, you must open up to the risk of the event, you must also see, and, and it's so logical, no? Conditions of the minorities for which he, in a sense, also takes it upon himself to, to be the representative thinker, the, they are already at a threshold. How can you risk? They suppose this change brings, they makes the condition even worse. So you must also build certain kinds of 
a rational rational um, safeguards so literally the, the word safeguards i'm using reservation is one such safeguard so i think he was doing both things at the same time and unfortunately a lot of communist thinkers are not able to quite appreciate that they they some of them do like ambedkar they see is the force of his thought but they also say oh why is he getting into this constitutional legalistic state what hope can there be uh, for the for the uh, you know condition of the for, for for the for the oppression of the masses but at so revolution is the only way and because yes revolution but who is to guarantee the revolution will not make things worse and no communist can say i can guarantee sure after what has happened hence ambedkar is neither an anti revolutionary thinker like today the state wants to or a lot of people want to make him out to be but oh he's just a basically a buddhist thinker within the larger more sort of generous hindu field nor he is he a purely a revolutionary thinker in the in the in the in the violent but of course very exciting marxist sense he is someone who is a revolutionary thinker who will be uncompromising in so far as revolution means thinking of new principles on a collective egalitarian basis but also in so far as the consequences historical consequences of th such thinking is concerned he is also very very vigilant about trying to keep a rational sort of a, a rational mapping of these consequences now is that possible that is a question which is very difficult to answer in a clear yes or no today i added permanent election <laughs> from the other side yeah, yeah. yeah. So also the subjective ambedkar was always saying the weakness with uh, the dominant marxist thinking is that subjectively yeah. uh, we are not sure what is going on it's too much ideological theory uh, so the subject has to have some kind of a uh, some sort of a um, place of its own as 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 a locus of thought it cannot be subject cannot be purely a reflex of ideology reflex of a system and that's why he keeps he talks about in uh, marx of buddha that point of energizing the buddha is a point of subjective energizing yeah. and at the same time buddha is not a metaphysical source buddha is not in that sense even in the islamic thinking or even christian thinking a sovereign buddha is not yeah. buddha is a mortal buddha died yeah. a human death so he is not speaking of that speaking of buddha is something else which is you know <coughs> Uh, enlightenment if you want or intelligence of thought whatever yeah so yeah uh, uh, well i mean the, basically the nothing has to be sustained at the nothing must remain at the end not um, um, this is this, the the language is betrays you i meant i didn't mean that at the end there would be nothing i meant nothing as yes. as the as the attribute or as the as that reality must remain But what happens with counter revolution thought is the nothing is filled up the nothing is they start with the nothing they But they fill it up. Contrary, fills it up, and that's why a lot of funny things happen, no? Which are, of course, funny things which have horrible consequences. So, for instance, I mean, again, uh, popular situation example. Uh, this this thing of science, science as a modern idea, and we had it always. <laughs> yeah, plastic surgery or technology, whatever, aeroplanes. now one response to that is is the is a kind of positivistic response no no we didn't 
or it is a modern app, I think. Um, it is something which has, which, which has to verify through the actual scientific works and the, the actual thing. Yes, fair enough, but it doesn't help anyone because the person who is saying it uh, has a certain belief that uh, it did exist. It's a purely, it's, it's, it's a belief, what to do with it. But the problem is somewhere else, no? which you can actually expose as a critique or through a critique, which is this. That why do you need the measure of modern science for a, for that belief in the in the eternal on the immemorial? Yeah. This is the problem. Point is point is not that whether uh, plastic surgery used to happen or something else used to happen in the past or not. We have not seen the past. Maybe it did. Maybe it did. that's not the point. Point is why are you, you accept that the the measure of what happened in the past is in the same great modernist positivism. This is the problem. So you measure it by the that very modern thing which you want to uh, sit, uh, you know, you want to uh, to supersede by saying we always had it. And to do that, you do these contorted, perverse operations. You first take out the past, empty it out, but then you fill it up with this absurd content. This is this is the contradiction. On the other hand, the nothing of revolution is this. And that is what I said a moment back to Mira, that the nothing of revolution is, this, nothing here means contingency. Things can change. Uh, but, and in that sense, change can also be something which is, which is a very ruptural kind of a change. But it is not a guarantee. Its measure is not given. See, that is the problem. So revolution, you can't say, I judge the revolution by the measure even before the revolution. No. The revolution is, is to produce a new measure. But what that measure will be, I, ca I cannot know unless I go through that uh, cauldron. And to that extent, there are no guarantees. Things might turn out to be worse. I mean, not worse merely in the ordinary sense, but more complicated. And usually they have. I mean, look at the, the whole story of Marxism, communism and the left. Can anyone say straight out, oh, the whole thing was a big waste of time? Or even the French Revolution. You can't say that. No one can say that. Any sane person can't say that. He, you know, uh, whether on the left, right, center, it doesn't matter. The measure of our times lies in these things. It is not dispensable. But the measure emerged through that very failure of the so-called left. Yeah? So this is the point. It's a question of subjective methodology. That is what I'm trying. What counter-revolution does is tries to make that subjective methodology into an objective, mythico-scientific kind of a, a content. And there it totally lands in, 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 a, in, a, in a tremendous amount of trouble and creates trouble for all of us. This is the problem. So this is the dis distinction between the two nothings. So the nothing must always remain. Nothing must be guaranteed uh, and filled up so that it becomes rigid. That, that is the point. No, I, I'm, I, I did avoid the question of translation. Uh, there is, I mean, there, that in my work, in my book, uh, the chapter on comparis, comparativism actually talks about it. It uses a part of Walter Benjamin where you, you don't merely translate you, the text, you also translate the very condition of untranslatability. So you translate the fact that translation is impossible. So in a sense, trans, the uh, translation carries its, its own um, sort of it's meta translational impossibility. So, which means what? Which means knowing that you can't translate, why do you translate? This is always the question. So, translation and comparison are not different. You don't compare when all things are already given to your comparison. You compare when things are incomparable. This is the whole point. This is the point. You decide only when things are not decided. This is the whole point. If 
things were decidable, then you wouldn't decide. If I have a fever, I'll go to the doctor. That is not a decision. But a doctor when is examining me and sees many symptoms and is within the limits of the doctor's knowledge, is not sure what is going on and has to decide on a particular course of treatment, he has to take a decision or withdraw from the you know, treatment and say, go to that other, other guy. He can do it or she can do it. So decision is in the f in, it takes place in the face of undecided. Similarly, translation takes place when you are faced with the reality that things are not translatable in the sense that translation is supposed to be a mirroring of the object of translation or a you know one-on-one -on -one correspondence. So I am not at all uh, either avoiding or uh, indifferent to the question of translation. On the contrary, I am saying that. I'm interested in the very condition for translation and the fact that we must, we always translate. Precisely because we all, all, always translate, I am indeed a somewhat, uh, somewhat um, uh, skeptical about uh, philological, uh, what I call uh, philological f fetishism is, not, is a too strong a word, but a kind of philological ideology, which means that you do several things then. You translate and for translating you gain more knowledge about the original, in that sense enter into deep philological terrain and then you do a third. Up to here I am absolutely, I, I have learned so much and I, I really profit, I myself have not done it but I really profit from people who do these two things. And you also have the modesty to say translation is impossible. But then you do a third thing. You also, in a sense, disparage the very, the very activity of translation uh, by, by saying that the translation must be measured against the original every time. This part I am not so sure about. Because it, A, it, it seems to make the original into an innocent, positive reality. I doubt there is any such original. A text is an original insofar as it is an object, a factual object. It is not original in the sense of a sovereign origin. For that, again, that old uh, theological problem would arise. The origin would have to leave the world. So the Gita is actually a text like that. It is an original insofar as it is that text and even that is not an original, you know, it is grafted out of many other texts. But anyway, if you take the Gita as, as, as it present, exists at, at present, yes, it is an original. But it is not an original insofar as it is already a whole set of discursive conventions, practices and political ideologies that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, are networked in in time and in space in complicated ways of which Gita is a node. So instead of an origin, I would rather speak of a node, a point of condensation, a point of application of intensities. And translation is part of that rather than a simple linear idea of original translation. Because if you have that, then you get into a bad conscience. You cannot but translate and you are always unhappy, translation is not good enough. This is a bad conscience problem, uh, which actually leads to a lot of difficulty of research. So, uh, you know, you, your own research is partly affected by the bad conscience, but also you then start judging others' research by this, this kind of a, a mentality, which is really damaging. That does not mean that I in any way uh, discount, and not forget discount, in any way look at philological as anything less than philosophy, let's put it like that. On the contrary, I mean, I find it really very enjoyable to read great philological works. I myself have done nothing regarding that, that's a different thing. So yeah, that would be my No, I understand what you're saying. Absolutely. So let's take the first one. 
you're right. It, it, the election itself is not uh, the, uh, the, the main platform. It's election is only election is only an opportunity to consolidate or to uh, to reincite a counter revolutionary project because it gives you a certain immediate force and legitimacy and institutional you know opportunity it's an opportunity that doesn't make election in itself counter i mean election is anyway part of the whole apparatus yeah. which includes right citizenship and so on and so forth so it is a limited idea so Within the limited idea of elections, we have to distinguish between the conditions in which elections are fought. And those conditions are not peculiar to only 2014 or life after 2014. Absolutely right. It goes back to a long way back. I would say, I mean, to that extent I would be an optimist. I would say conditions probably in certain respects have got better. Maybe, partly, very little but still better than when Ambedkar gave a speech to HCF, uh, Scheduled Caste Federation and spoke of communal majority, where he said very clearly, he said, it is a communal majority, Hindu communal majority. So you can have as many elections as you want, but you will never get a true democratic political majority. He was very clear. So he said, we must have safeguards so that minorities do not suffer. So you must actually overcompensate. So minorities <coughs> must be given place in the government. They must have quota in the government for executive positions, for governmental positions, for ministers. Nothing to do with elections, irrespective of elections. But of, but of course, those who win must get greater representation. That is true. But winning must not determine political life. Because winning is only based on major, uh, communal majority, permanent communal majority. was as clear as that. Now, maybe in our times we can say, yes, this is true on one scale, but on other scales, little more movement, little more sort of uh, possibility of combining, for instance, Bahujan politics. Bahujan politics allying with other politics, including Mayavati is allied with Brahmins, Brahminical, you know. So all of these combinations, coalitions and so on. So history of elections then would be on a limited scale a history of variation. To that extent, it is not simply that 2014 is the first time that a communal majority has come. So, uh, th that would be an absurd reasoning. and. Uh, my, I wrote an article uh, and it was published in Hindi translation and this misunderstanding arose and someone wrote uh, anonymously a kind of rebuttal of my article and there was a strong criticism and it was correct though out of a misunderstanding. It says, how come in 2014 suddenly communal majority arises? Why not before? So, you know, your question of Nehru. How come Nehru is okay but this 2014 is all wrong? Makes no sense, no? So. We have to say that the communal majoritarian structure, whether in a very obvious way or in a cryptic way or in a combination of these ways, is already there. But different elections, because of different conditions, produce different degrees of this communal majority. But with 2014, what happens is something else in one sense. Not the election results, but that given that this election results again produced this result and the result had a certain majoritarian party coming into power, gave that party a chance to now say, in a kind of metaphysical strategy, that this is the only true election. Every other election till now has been, doesn't have that same degree of truth. This is a different discourse. And to do that, all kinds of other strategies are also employed, corporate strategy. Because this is an election, 2014, where not only election results, but also the threshold of India's development, the election matches the threshold of development. Not just that, it also matches India's high degree of securitarian consciousness vis-a-vis -vis its enemy country. So the election comes at the right moment of many other things so that if you put it all together, this is the true election. So election is not a problem at that level. The, the way elections are used to produce a larger discourse, which is highly counter-revolutionary or anti-political, that is it. But that doesn't mean that just because elections has produced a result, produced a result, that uh, strategy is totally successful. So that's why uh, events will happen and have happened, resistance will happen and have happened. But does that mean like it was being hoped in the new election by some people that all of this is going to lead to a new result? No, it didn't. So that's what I'm saying. Election 
Suppose the opposite had happened. Suppose some other government had come. Then your question would have come back. Does this mean this new government is a revolutionary government? That would be absurd, no. Whichever government had come, not this one. No, it would still be just a government with all kinds of elements. So even then, elections wouldn't be either the final measure or the final verdict on politics. But yes, it would be an occasion to again rethink the configuration. So that is what I'm saying. So it's a kind of, it's a practical approach, but based on the fundamental distinction of political majority and communal majority. So that distinction is very valid. You can't say that elections are a representation of a political majority. As simple as that. No. Election are, elections are a representation of a particular, at a particular stage of a certain of a certain degree of consolidation of certain forces among the people, which can then lead to further consolidations of communal majority, of uh, securitarian. So there, there is a third kind of understanding of the majority that I haven't spoken here, which I would like to indicate. It is not just a communal majority and a corporate modern majority, individual. It is also an Indianist majority. How, what do I mean by that? Just think of the situation in Kashmir. And the question that has been raised about Article 370 and 35A. It has been said again and again that Article 370 is not permanent, it is temporary, again and again. Why? How can you say it again and again? Because you have a majority of, us of this kind. In Kashmir, it, is, it appears as a kind of Indianist majority. At the constitutional level, I'm not going into separatism and all that. That's a different thing. I mean, not different, but you know, that, uh, that is not what I'm saying. I'm saying at the constitution because people are responding to the election. But if you come and say that we have a majority and now the particular article which gives Kashmir a special status will not be there or we are trying to dissolve or abrogate it, then surely you're doing it on the basis of this majority, this majority confidence, this majority legitimation. But is it a majority which is... Uh, which includes the Kash Kashmiri opinion, that is debatable, surely. So, for the situation in Kashmir, it becomes then a kind of, not just a communal majority or a corporate majority, it also becomes an Indianist majority, a kind of sovereignist majority. Yeah. Now, all of this is not because of the election. It is not, Kashmir is not because of election. Dalit politics is not because of election. But election is an occasion to reconfigure and consolidate and do something with these realities. That is what I'm saying. So that is the first uh, answer. What was the second one? Uh, uh, sar ah, the Sarjanik, uh, the uh, Satyashodak. Now, I would not call Pule's work counter-revolutionary. It's a reform, it, it is a particular direction in reform. See, counter-revolutionary, not with only specific, it's not like RSS is counter-revolutionary and uh, CPM is counter and CPIML is something or, you know, Dalit Panth. It is not a simply organizational distinction. Satyashoda. No. Counter-revolution lies. That's why its philosophy is important here. It's the principles. I don't think Satyashodak's movement and Pule's thinking in itself is counter-revolutionary insofar as counter-revolutionary means conservative. Now, the method can be different. But fundamentally, Pule's uh, principles are principles which, which want to actually not restore an old truth, but to bring a new truth in the world. The methods can be different from Ambedkar's methods. So Ambedkar can also be called counter-revolutionary by a Marxist who believes the state should be you know, captured by violent means. That is a different level. I am not interested in that discussion that much. The point is, in principle, do you think a new truth is possible or do you think there are some permanent old truths which need to be brought back? With Pule, surely a new truth, Satyashodak, search for truth, is a search for a new truth. So I don't think Pule, uh, Pule's uh, movement and, and Ambedkar, I don't think, ever would agree that Pule's movement is gone. On the contrary, he would say Pule's movement is an inspiration for his own revolutionary thinking. But yes, so Kabir. Is Kabir a counter-revolutionary? No. But is Kabir a revolutionary, a thinker of the revolution in the sense Ambedkar thinks? No. I think. But he's definitely a poetic inspiration for, uh, for, for Ambedkar. With Buddhism, actually, it is far more complicated because Buddha himself is a revolutionary. 
but because Buddhism has a long history of organization. If there is a counter-revolutionary, revisionist, degenerate, whatever you want to, bad thing you want to call it, Ambedkar himself says, it has happened with Buddhism. Because Buddhism is a history of organization. And after a point what happens is, organizations simply lose their original principle. They just go out of the window. <coughs> they are not there. That is indeed a, 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 a time of decadence. To that extent, if not counter-revolutionary, definitely open to being or amenable to being captured by forces of counter-revolution. So Buddhism have, definitely has been. Per se, there is no guarantee that just the name, so again, the name question that Zameer performed yesterday uh, is very much uh, relevant here. The name is not a guarantee against uh, revolutionary truth as against counter-revolutionary conservative um, sort of uh, ideology. Buddhism doesn't guarantee anything. I mean, just how do you look at Burma? Rohingya Muslims are in the hands of Buddhist, a Buddhist state. What will you do with this? Will you say, will you fetishize Buddhism and say, no, no, we will not listen to anything bad about Buddhism? Won't work. Will you now do that with Islam because Rohingya is Muslim? No, again, it won't work. It doesn't work like that. I mean, you're not saying it. I'm just saying in general as a discussion, it doesn't work like that. So we have to, again, open what I call a research program on the concrete conditions of that particular organization and at the same time theoretical history, organizational and theoretical history. Whether it be Buddhism, whether it be something else, doesn't matter at that level. Yeah. With Ambedkarism itself, who is to guarantee that the state will not take it over and make something absolutely else out of it? At some later point, if someone says, no, we need to completely change this Ambedkarism into something else. I hope it doesn't happen, but that is the way uh, people want to take it, no? Uh, dominant forces. But today, my contention is, it is it is not that with Ambedkarism. That's why the word Dalit, an, an advisory was sent to all the media houses, don't use the word Dalit. Why would such a thing be done? Because the word Dalit has a charge which the state cannot manage. So, at this point at least, uh, the word Dalit as a signifier or as a word seems to have a, have a force which the state administrative anti-political space is not able to quite capture. Interestingly, with all the problems, it seems Naxalism and Maoism is something they can capture. So hence they can, isn't it paradoxical? They promote the idea of Naxalism, though in a negative way, but they promote it. While the word Dalit, they would rather not hear. There's something going on here. No, so yeah, okay, why didn't you develop it? I thought you were saying that Satyashodak Samaj itself is some kind of... No, oh, no, sorry. No, I, I think that was a So, so I got a bit um, uh, surprised that why... Yeah. Okay, so sorry, so sorry, I'm so sorry. No, no. Uh, uh, all right, why, why, I mean, why you, not... You counter in the sense well, counter yeah. Brahman. 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 Took Pule as a master, and in in the in the in the in the in the in the inheritance of politics, no doubt about it. At the same time, Ambedkar, Ambedkar's thinking on Buddhism was uh, was uh, something which was original and innocence and innovation, uh, somewhat different from Pule, because Ambedkar wanted Buddhism to be, in my language, event, but you can also think of it as something which is contingent. Something which was, which which was, historical, uh, uh, and at the same time had that weight of history. With Pule, what happens is that Satyashodak itself is a is a, is the original revolutionary, nineteenth century 
moment of moving into a kind of modernity a kind of political modernity in a localized uh, in a localized maharashtra region but phule also because he is also uh, a theoretician of the past of history phule also produces a kind of uh, a kind of in a, the a, a theory of, a, of an indigenous people, a theory of, of a, a kind of nativism, a Dalit nativism, uh, which is historical, which is historical, it has nothing to do with theology. At the same time, it does have a certain, uh, a certain po a positivist, a factual claim, almost a positive, that things started here. We are, we are, we come from here. They come from there. Hmm? Ambedkar had a had a certain uh, disagreement with that premise. Ambedkar's premise was everything is originally mixed, but that doesn't mean all mixtures are of of are of the same uh, have the same effect. Some mixtures are good, some are uh, indifferent, some are bad. So depending on the analysis of the mixture in the present. We must now try and find both practical, immediate uh, responses to that mixture, what to do with it, and also we must examine the mixture in terms of its historical formation, genealogy. And Buddhism was part of the contemporary mixture for it. And uh, one of the queries with Ambedkar is, why did he choose Buddhism? Your question also, why not that one? So uh, some people say because uh, Buddhism, and that's that's the view which comes from a kind of um, post-colonial kind of a way of thinking. That because it was Indic, yeah, very close to someone saying that Buddhism is part of the larger Hindu. Yeah, Buddha is also an avatar. Uh, but a simply reading Buddha for Ambedkar as a, as a writer as a thinker was so inspiring, just like Kabir and Pule. That's one. So Buddha was Ambedkar's contemporary at that level, yeah. not someone in the past. That's one thing. The second thing is, as a historical reality, which is also, like I said, a history of organization, Ambedkar did something extraordinary, you know. Precisely because Buddhism had degenerated as an organizational form, Ambedkar found a weak point Ambedkar had to move into the place and create something new. He could not possibly do that with the other religions. Because after all, there was a lot of lobbying going on at that time. Christians, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism. Ambedkar took Sikhism very seriously. He was deeply attracted to Sikhism in certain respects. But these religions were already too consolidated. So in that respect, I like Lenin's theory that you strike at the weak link. Ambedkar, in a way, moved into the weakest part of this whole range of possible... But of course, he had to already evaluate philosophically that religion. And for him, Buddha was already a great thinker, egalitarian thinker, or the greatest. That part was clear for him. Just like Pulevo. But organizationally, for him, Buddhism had the advantage of being a, being a large... Because this is also a question of organization. Pule was not a person who was that much concerned with political organization. He was concerned with organization at the level of education, at the level of a certain research program of, uh, of a sort that is more organic to, um, to, 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 um, to those particular spaces where uh, Pule himself had an immediate engagement, uh, both in terms of um, the intellectual engagement, but also economic. So he was greatly, um, he was greatly concerned about the peasants, no, uh, about the kunbi, about about people who were related uh, to the land question. Uh, for Ambedkar, all of this had to be uh, had to be supplemented with something more abstract, which is organization in the sense of a political organization, mass organization. So the Congress story cannot be neglected. He opposed the Congress through, consistently. But Congress was the measure of what an organization is at that time. Yeah. 
So in a sense, he, he also challenged the Congress, uh, he also challenged the Congress uh, through his own experiments with organizations. Pule never did that. And that was not Pule's, uh, sorry, that was not Pule's interest. So I think this can be also seen uh, in terms of organization, that Buddhism, Buddhism gave him an organization, it also gave him an opportunity to move into that organization. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood uh, earlier. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Um, he, 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 uh, he, in his own time, uh, he did not think of forging alliances uh, with uh, with the neighboring castes, so to speak. He he was very clear about uh, his location, initial location in Mahar, and he was also clear about the change from that very location to something which is global, which is Buddhism. Global, not in the sense of corporate global, but international is global, which is Buddhism. He was not particularly thinking of this, uh, um, this politics of alliance. He did ally mostly with Muslim League. No? His alliances were actually very specific to, in the Bombay presidency election, with Muslim League. Uh, not so much as you're right. Not so much with, uh, with so-called neighboring castes. Uh, so he would want that kind of a rigor that we take it uh, at the level of something which is at, at, at the initial point a very clear um, sort of identi identitarian, identitarian uh, place which is Semahar and then take it to something which is which has an amplitude which is much more than any caste politics in the in the ordinary you know sense. So yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And with with Puli, of course. The whole idea of uh, alliance uh, was different. Because with Pule, uh, uh, Bhart, Brahmid, and you people, of course, you can teach me a lot more about this because this is literally about the history of life here, so society here. Uh, the idea of Bhatt is actually a, a category which, from which everyone else has to be subtracted. So, in a sense, uh, even Kshatriya for him has a possibility of allying with the Shudra against the against the part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is not something which Ambedkar ever uh, considered as, uh, in, his, in his own thinking, as uh, um, the main strategy or the main, the main basis. So, uh, so in the question of uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim, um, and in the contemporary um, situation, uh, see, um, there are two things here. One is uh, you're right that the entire Congresses, uh, and in in that speech again that I mentioned to um, Scheduled Caste Federation, Ambedkar mm -hmm. says it very clearly that the Congress has actually uh, adopted a policy of appeasement. So he uses the word appeasement clearly. Uh, appeasement, but he says that it is not simply appeasement, it is actually an oscillation, an alternation between bullying and appeasement. So Congress both bullies and appeases. So appeasement, actually this is something which I, a long time back I spoke at a certain meeting on this, on the Muslim question. And this question, appeasement has always intrigued me. Why do you need to appease somebody only when you have really, really done something bad to them? Appeasing is all. Appeasing is anger. No, appease you, appease anger. You appease people's sense of injustice, that they have been done injustice to. So in a way, the very fact that people say that Congress adopted a policy of appeasement, in a way, already, uh, 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 already 
uh, implies that you uh, you also say that Congress has treated uh, has caused a sense of injustice in Muslims themselves. So it is not so different, though on a completely different scale, from the demonetization example. If the Muslims have, uh, I mean, on an on a overall scale, if the Muslims have voted for Congress, uh, uh, you know, over, over time in independent India, then it could also be because they have thought that precisely because <coughs> there is no one else who determines our lives as much as Congress does, precisely because they determine it badly, but they are the ones who determine it, we must stay with them. The same logic, though on a, in a very different modality, no doubt. Yeah. So the point is to solve the very condition which requires this appeasement, where the other, of appe the other side of appeasement is bullying. You know? And in a way, today when people say that uh, the majoritarian ideology says that uh, the Muslims have been appeased and now, now we must have a kind of formal sameness between all... So citizenship. So citizenship is what, the, what, what is used. The NRC is an example of that. Citizenship is what is used both as a, as, as a term of neutrality, a revisionist term in my language of neutrality, but at the same time as a partisan tool by saying in, the, in, in Assam and in the Northeast, we will not give citizenship to the Muslims because Muslims have a homeland elsewhere. Now this is a very strange but uh, not uh, an accidental idea of the, of the homeland. Because if you read Savarkar, you see that Savarkar talks about Punya Bhumi. So Muslims have a different Punya Bhumi, pilgrimage too, than the Hindus. So to that extent, the Hindus will be accepted as part of the, the citizenship uh, bill, if it is ever passed at all, because in this kind of metaphysical political uh, logic, and um, Christoph Jaffelard had written about this in a different um, context some years back, it's because India or this territory is the pilgrimage of Hindus, or Hindus have to return to that place of pilgrimage, just like Muslims are meant to, uh, to, to, to go to their Punya Bhumi mm -hmm. elsewhere in another land. And Christians uh, to, 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 to uh, <coughs> Israel, uh, the Jews and the Christians uh, too. So different, to different kinds of uh, Punya movies. Now this kind of logic, uh, Congress did not ever, uh, they did not ever uh, espouse, of course. They did not ever um, present. But what they did was, they did the opposite thing. They, they kept everything as it is. And while everything remained as it is, this oscillation of bullying and um, appeasing continued. So that today you have this other crazy global theory of a kind of, so you have a kind of, a kind of crazy version of internationalism, a Hindu internationalism for the first time. So all, all, all Hindus can come back to India now, and we are we are willing to give you citizenship. It is an internationalism, but it's an internationalism which is nation oriented, rather than the opposite. From nation to opening up, it's an international to back to so This has happened. This is in the model of of Israel. No, clearly in the model of Israel, the diasporic logic, but theologically uh, determined. The, the the force of it, even the violence of it, is theologically determined. This is the model, clearly. Uh, that, but the opportunity for this has come from precisely Congress. There's no doubt about that. Into my, in my mind, uh, that is one one overall um, statement. Now, on the present situation of how to, uh, and in that sense, it's part of a long history of counter revolution, which doesn't start with the present dispensation. Yeah. Absolutely, there's no question about that. Exactly, you could you could say that, yeah. Uh, now, on the present uh, situation, um, it seems to me that uh, mm, the see the Dalit framework is 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 I think a very useful and more than useful. Uh, it 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 is a it is an emancipatory framework in so far as Dalit has that political philosophical. Uh, 
power or potential of standing for universal emancipation. Uh, so it is actually a Dalit, uh, not of the, of the descriptive kind, yeah. but it's a Dalit who, which makes the descriptive kind move into a universal emancipatory um, um, sort of semiotic space, you know. Uh, uh, now, this is a slightly, uh, uh, this is a slightly tricky area. Why? Because you will get a lot of people who will say, but in Muslims also there are castes. And there are. So, Muslim Dalits and other Dalits taken together as Dalit movement, yes. But, yeah, and that is completely true. Completely true. But if you simply stop at that, then what it seems is that it must be a larger Dalit alliance across religions. Christian, Muslim and Hindu particularly. Now, while that is an absolutely crucial project and different alliances are a bit like that in at least local elections, but the idea of Muslim today uh, uh, has to be seen, it seems to me, in, and this is very contemporary in to the extent that Muslims have been uh, have been op have completely been made into a specter of, of some kind of a, a, a Islamophobic specter. Uh, Muslims have to be seen in many ways at the same time. The reality of Muslim society is heterogeneous, and castes are because it's also to do with. Muslim elitism of within society to do with uh, a, a whole set of historical circumstances. But that does not mean that caste in itself is not a Hindu paradigm. So this is this distinction must be maintained. Because again, uh, certain post-colonial scholars who don't like uh, caste to be equated with uh, this, this the, what, what they think is a more Catholic idea of religion, a more sort of religion shouldn't be made into dogma, should, can be understood in a larger, uh, say that caste, why, why, why should we take caste as something uh, which is a Hindu paradigm, like Ambedkar does. Ambedkar has no compunction about saying Hindu, no? He clearly says Hindu. We shouldn't uh, get ourselves pinned by that Hindu uh, uh, nomenclature. We should say caste and we should include Muslim society or any other society which has caste. Now, factually, and for political activists, particularly Muslim political activists, that's very true. Just like on the question of the hijab and women's rights, all of these movements are very specific to that specific conditions in specific societies. That is very true. But as a paradigm, as a paradigm, I think the, the, the point from which the, the logic and, uh, of oppression and the logic of injustice comes is a Hindu paradigm, that is of caste. <coughs> in that sense, it is not the same thing as patriarchy. It is not the same thing as patriarchy as actually something which cuts across religions and societies. Again, that does not mean caste and patriarchy should be seen as two separate discrete things. That is not true at all, because they are articulated. But again, if you articulate, if you, if you, if you articulate them in very specific ways, then you get very specific results, something which never occurred to me. So in a certain context uh, in Delhi, in a certain conversation, I think Sukriti uh, is aware of this conversation. I think I forget, maybe in LSR when we went to speak uh, on um, Rohit's uh, anniversary of his death, uh, this point came up, uh, that the question of uh, family is not the same for a Dalit as, and a lower caste as it is for the upper caste family, even with the, in relation to gender. What does that mean? It means that for the upper caste family with, a, with patriarchal oppression, it is true that a certain kind of individualism of the woman which is suppressed and curbed needs to be freed. Absolutely true. While Dalit patriarchy or patriarchy in Dalit families is as much a fact, the same kind of notion does not quite apply. Why? Because insofar as Dalit families as a collective are the subject to caste oppression, family is also a political unit of resistance. Even if the family itself is also a patriarchal family. This would not hold for an upper caste family. So these distinctions have to be made in every case. But that does not make the paradigm something which is simply a, a, a paradigm of 
different specific differences to be put together. To that extent, in the case of caste, Muslim, while in Muslim society all of these complications are there, today the name of the Muslim or the Muslim name is irrespective of caste, literally uh, an again an occasion of danger, a kind of a threat of, of the life of a Muslim. Now, of course, if you look at it a little more sort of concretely, you will see that poorer Muslims, which means people from the lower caste more than upper caste, because they are the ones who are in on the roads, they are the ones who will be targeted for uh, what what is called cow the cow problem and so on and so forth. Precisely because lower caste people are more more exposed. But again, this does not mean the paradigm should be changed. The paradigm of Muslim should be made relative to all these conditions. Because in our present conditions, both the caste paradigm is Hindu and the Muslim paradigm is the paradigm of minoritism in the sense of that exceptional minority. Of course, it's on a global scale also. But that also does not mean that the Muslim is a homogeneous category. So these, these distinctions and at the same time the point where the, that common reality comes together both must be kept in mind when we make our political choices and decisions. What those decisions will be will depend on people who are, you know, in the field. But I think these are the points which, which we need to keep in mind in our present conjunction. <coughs>
with Rajabongshi um, um, people who, who people who uh, uh, do a lot of work in in, in Amoshudra and Rajabongshi politics. Not all of them accept the word Dalit. But to me, that is not something which uh, takes away the force of Dalit. On the contrary, it confirms the force of Dalit. Yeah, force of Dalit. But Bahujan indeed is a very very important uh, opening up to that extent trying to make it a more uh, a, a more uh, a mass a, a, a term of of uh, not just constitutional but uh, but thinking of mass politics yeah i mean it, representation yeah. it is uh, bahujan politics yes. definitely has a strong interest in representation becomes very, 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 very important. But, uh, you know, Bahujan politics and Mayavati, I mean, it is, it is uh, quite remarkable. I went to Bengal recently to speak in, uh, not in Calcutta, but in Kalyani, one of the small, small um, places outside Calcutta. Uh, and it was a, it was a conference on Dalit, Dalit studies. So, Manoranjan Vyapari, a very forceful, spectacular Bengali writer, Dalit writer, he was there. Some of us were there speaking. And some of the uh, some of the topics were, had to do with Dalit, Dalit and gender, caste and gender, and I I found so much conversation in Bengal on Mayavati, and I found Mayavati was such an inspiration that, and she's she's the emblem of Bajan politics, but it was not electoral, it was something else, it was something more or something. Actually, in Bengal, it doesn't. It makes no sense for it to be electoral because Bahujan has no Bahujan party, uh, has no presence as a as a as a electoral force, no, in Bengal. But Mayavati and Bahujan party has the force of of, of a counter intellectual movement, as a kind of counter hegemonic movement against the the, the Bengali upper caste uh, intellectual um, 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 sort of fortress fortresses, and that work they've been doing since Kanchanam's time, and I found that because some people talked to me. And Mayavati plays such an important part in all of this. Not as a culture, not the Mayavati whose statue is in question or, you know, Mayavati is a real political figure. It's a real political force. And particularly as a woman. Very, you can't really match that Mayavati with today's Mayavati. Because today's Mayavati is actually into electoral politics and a lot of other things, which in themselves are things which are also important, but whatever, that's a different... There is some, at least, there is some discrepancy between the Mayavati that is inspiring that situation because in, we must remember that in, in, in Bengal, the entire Dalit question is really, really limited to very, very marginal spaces. It is dominated by other forces. So there, Bahujan Dalit, they are not seen as separate or it's all a marginal but a very authentic force that is trying to force its way into into conversation. So that's what I discovered. Yeah. Well, this is so much yeah, that <laughs> I, I'll have to sort of take a long pause and start all over again. Uh, but let me try and briefly make some sense for myself of these things. Uh, so the, the, uh, let me take the event question first. So Bhima Koreka. Now, Bhima Koreka is a, is a specific place with a certain historical narrative attached to it, a commemorative practice and ritual <coughs> or ceremony, which has something to do with the colonial context and a <coughs> particular military project and so on and so forth. But what is the idea that uh, one commemorates? In that sense, it's not a question of commemorating, because commemoration is really ceremonial. You will make some kind of an image of the past and you will remember it. That's all right. But if it's an idea, then it must be carrying on. In a very different way, but still carrying on. The event is really 
the, the everything is staked on this carrying on. If I say Bhima Koranga is an event, it doesn't matter whether it's an event then or event now. Point is, it's carrying on, though in a in a very different way from different times, but it's carrying on. So uh, there, uh, the question of Bhima Koranga is, if it's ca it's not even the only question of commemorating. Commemorating to can be actually made into a very clear statement. We commemorate, it's a speech act. We commemorate this great victory of the Maha Regiment. We commemorate this, uh, we salute these soldiers. We commemorate and salute the martyrs and so on. That's somewhat different. But suppose we say it's, it is something which triggers a possibility, which uh, before that couldn't be imagined, couldn't be thought of, then that is something different. So the question is, if Bhima Koregao can be thought of as an event, hence Bhima Koregao is also a hypothesis. But the hypothesis can be activated through our thinking about if we can be made subjects to that event. Or if someone is made a subject to that event and we can say, yes, the Dalits today are a subject to that event. Then whether it is factually what it is, is not really the point. So a lot of, you know, after uh, what happened in 2017, a lot of writing has happened on it. Alan Tumde has a very different position on this whole question. Because it is also a historical approach to that actually in history what it was. There is a doubt that oh, was this in the service of colonial rule and so on. But that for the moment let us suspect. I think we can take uh, help from Ambedkar in one of the things he says and I mentioned this at some point in the last two talks that I gave uh, in Annihilation of Caste. And he says uh, to, in fact, uh, something in Shomik's talk actually, question of civil civil war, strife. Um, mm, Ambedkar said that Dalits want the right to bear arms. Was this a militaristic declaration? Because it doesn't fit with overall Ambedkar's work, no? Ambedkar hardly ever took a militaristic position on anything. But he did say very clearly, Dalits want the right to bear arms. So there are two ways to look at this. One is that Dalits are in danger, physical danger. Hence, as a right of self-defense. But if you are in physical danger in your own society, as a perpetual condition, it's some kind of a civil war. And civil war, technically, should be, an, is also a E equality between the warlike parties on both sides, but it is not. Dalits are in a civil war condition, but they are not, they don't have the right to bear arms. So, this is one way of looking at it. The other way, in the Bhima Koregao case is more relevant, I think. Dalits want the right to bear arms, not because they want to go to war, necessarily. Individually, they could join the army, that's all right. And army is very important. You must remember, Ambedkar <coughs> wanted to end his life uh, sorry, uh, towards the end of his life, apart from all the works that I've mentioned, he wanted to write the military history in India. To, for, to me, that is a fascinating question, his interest in military history. You get a glimpse of that in Thoughts on Pakistan, his engagement with military history. Now, in the light of all of this, one of the ways of thinking about the right to bear arms is, that Dalits, as anyone else, have a capacity to, to resist. It's a capacity. It is not a capacity limited to the Kshatriya. Just like Dalits have the capacity for knowledge, it is not limited to the Brahmins. And capacity doesn't mean the physical act of fighting. Capacity means a kind of ontological, a kind of collective, even a kind of aesthetic capacity. Because war is not simply the act of going and fighting. War is also, I mean, after all, in the theatre we learn martial arts. We say martial arts, there no one becomes a pacifist. No one says, it's immoral to learn a martial art. No one says that. We learn martial arts. But that doesn't mean we want to go to war. What does that mean? It means as theatre artists, we want to increase our capacity. As movement, as a, as a movement both bodily but also overall, in our, in our overall being as actors. Similarly, the Dalit right to bear arms is a right to the capacity for subjectivizing oneself with that kind of uh, possibility. Nothing to do with 
going to war against someone. So in a way, Bhima Koregao, but Bhima Koregao is for real. A war was fought. There was a regiment of lower caste Mahar people and they won it. So what does that mean? It means in reality, it was demonstrated that such a capacity exists. And if such a capacity exists, then it exists for all times for everyone, all the lands. So yes, as a capacity, and that capacity is not a technical capacity. Capacity is an ontological capacity. It's a universal capacity. So to that extent, Bhima Koregao is an event, which as a capacity is not being commemorated, but is being lived. But it can't be lived simply smoothly, no? Because at every moment in history, the capacity is also being challenged, not anymore by the Peshwas of that time, but by forces here. And not in the same way, not necessarily in militarily, but socially, educationally, intellectually, philosophically. So to that extent, the capacity is not a technical or a specific faculty. Capacity is the generic capacity of being a person or being a subject with the, again to use Marx, with the fullness, the fullness of possibility. But the fullness of possibilities is illustrated by a specific event or a specific happening. That happening in this case is in the past in Bhima Koreva. In Mahad, it was a different happening. In Mahad, it was the happening of drinking water. But drinking water itself is not the thing because then it would just be a commemoration of a symbolic act. But it was the capacity to resist. So you are right to ask that question. The revolutionary hypothesis is born from a specific revolt. But a revolt itself doesn't mean a revolution. So uh, with Mahat, this is a question. Uh, Anand Tertumde has wrote his thesis, an excellent work, but he called his, calls Mahat a revolt. And to me, and I learned so much from Anand Tertumde, but I would still say it, it is not merely a revolt. It is a revolt which opens up a revolutionary hypothesis. So in that sense, the word revolution should not be uh, excluded from art or should not be, you know, blocked from art. Because, of course, if someone can say, uh, and Ambedkar himself said, that this is not a political revolution. This is a social act. A new state will not come out of Mahat. But the fact that it's a social act lays the seeds or lays the ground for the possibility of thinking of a new, not a new state merely, but a new form of political life, surely. Yeah? So, that, so that's what I'm saying again. I started out with saying this, that it's both the event but also its consequences. And the two can't be separate. So your last, uh, your question, that is very important. How do we know it is an event? We don't. That's the whole point. Event can't be known. Event is something which you, you have to you have to say, you have to say, if you say Bhima Koregao is an event and somehow you are able to bring that force to others, then it is. The, 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 the event is retrospective in the way we are looking at it. Otherwise, if event would be in the way we say a historical event, then it would be archaeological. Then you would say, there, are, there is evidence to say it was an event, but then that event is in the light of the past, not the way I am saying event or certain other thinkers uh, use the word event. Event here is used not in the sense of past, but in the sense of something which is present, but in the present creating what I call another present. But that another present retrospectively creates a new kind of chain, a new sequence. This is the method. That's the, the, the last. What was the earlier question you had? Oh, right. That is very important. So, ha, ha. so that is that is how it is. That when you posit something which is the sovereignty of a source which cannot be temporally or hum, uh, cannot be located in, within the human immanent sphere, then you have two options. One is to say, and Islam in that sense is the most rigorous religious kind of uh, power, uh, re religion of the state. Uh, when Islam says we are, I mean, tech, I mean theoretically, actually things are mixed up always. But theoretically, Islam has been rigorous, saying we simply are not sovereigns. We are servants of sovereignty. We serve. We are servants. And to that extent, uh, however much there might be material inequality, we are all equal. Uh, 
theoretically. Uh, in a way, Islam ha is a consistent theory of an impossible sovereignty on the imminent level, in the human level. So all the power effects and state and all that are actually in Islam uh, uh, have to be studied in terms of specific conditions of power in specific societies. But of course, if you take this totally distorted and terrible uh, sort of image of this non of servants, but terrorist terrorist servant, if you want the IS, yeah, the Islamic State idea. It's a peculiar idea. It is not a state in the sense of a territorial state. It is an Islamic state. But it is not a state in the sense of also a constitutional or a sovereign state because sovereignty lies in, yeah. So actually, peculiarly, the only parallel of the Islamic state is capital. This is the strange thing. Capital, capital doesn't have a territorial enclosure. Capital doesn't have any source from which it draws its so-called power. And yet, Capital is a regime of power. So Islamic State, it seems to me, in a very strange way, is at the other side of capital. And in a way, it is appropriating some Islamic notions. Uh, anyway, so that is one way of going about thinking about this theology. But the classical philosophical way of thinking about the theolo theological problem is there in counter-revolutionary thought from just Joseph de Maistre to Carl Schmitt and other people. In, in, in the Indian context, uh, we can, though with great modalities, think of the Gita, we can think of Tilak's work and other people along a similar kind of a lineage. So what is the logic? There? The logic there is that power must be generated by an alienation of sovereignty to executive organs, to kings, to uh, particular sources of exercise of power, but with the realization that the sources of the exercise of power precisely, in a sense, create a, a certain uh, create a certain distance from the truth. So your question of truth of sovereignty. So one of the paradoxes of theological sovereignty is that if sovereignty lies in God, then why does the church exist? And if the church exists, why does the secular king and the state exist? And yet they all do. Why does the uh, domain of taxation exist? If all wealth ultimately is meant to be laid at the door of uh, of some other force. So poverty is also even in Christianity praised so much. And yet all of the systems of government are there in, in, in that. So, so this is something which is, is in classical political theory is uh, solved or partly solved by saying that between the source of sovereignty and the exercise of sovereignty there is a certain distance and the distance must always be respected and when the distance is not respected then we have the we have the right to condemn that particular sovereign or that particular source of state power as corrupted state power so we have good kings and bad kings we have a good use of state and a bad use of state by the measure of sovereignty yeah. a kind of morality religious morality all of this comes into play. Now, with uh, democracy, with popular sovereignty, people's sovereignty, this logic gets uh, somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat scrambled. Uh, it's put in crisis. Because the ones to exercise sovereignty and the ones to have sovereignty are the same. So that's why counter-revolution says inherently democracy is corrupt. Or it is hypocritical. How can you be sovereign and then exercise sovereignty on someone else? Also, it is partly absurd or it's unsustainable at the national level. So international relations is also put in crisis. I mentioned this, you know, Treaty of Westphalia. With religion, with religion it is consistent. 
it makes sense for religion to say that my religion is a true religion and I am going to, you know, conquer all other religions and make them me, it's the one. It is tyrannical, it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is destructive, but it is consistent. But with the modern nation state based on some kind of idea of sovereignty as na nations of national sovereignty, there comes a problem. We say sovereignty is limited within the nation. But sovereignty, the very idea of sovereignty is unconditional. What is sovereignty? It means unconditional being. Someone who is not conditioned. But a nation by definition is conditioned by history. Hence you have to make a treaty. That's why treaties are made. That your sovereignty ends here, ours begin there. And hence a crisis also comes. That oh, so, uh, treaties uh, are not respected by actual forces and so on and so forth. So when modernity comes with revolution, like French Revolution, then like I uh, said the last time, uh, French Revolution says, we are not going to respect all this because now we have a new idea, not the idea of God, but the idea of revolution itself, for which we are going to enter other countries and, you know. Marx also said that proletariat has no country. But he didn't mean it in this uh, very sort of brutal sense of simply going into uh, uh, conquering the, uh, the countries to free the proletariat. He meant we must, we must make our philosophies commensurate with this internationalism. So, when we speak of Buddhist internationalism, again, the philosophical sophistication of Buddhism as a thought of the unconditional but within the world. In that sense, beyond the restriction of both nation and the constitution of the nation through citizenship must be thought of. But it is not the kind of violent contradiction that comes with uh, looking at it through an empirical revolution, that we must take the French Revolution to the other European countries. We must take the Russian Revolution now to the East, to Eastern Europe. Not like that. But of course, it's very difficult to maintain these distinctions, whether Buddhism or not. Buddhism can be as militaristic as communism or you know any other so yeah but th these are the distinctions too. in the education system yeah. in 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 so i mean the 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 veil controversy uh, now i mean it's all all over europe it has happened uh, that the veil stands for a kind of presence of physical presence of religion in civic life. It also stands for uh, a, a self, a, a, an immediate sense of um, of indignity for women if they are made to wear a veil. But in France, there was a major debate about it and, um, it, and it's there in all over the world that if women want to wear a veil <coughs> voluntarily, then isn't it part of not their religious rights, but their fundamental human rights to wear it. Uh, in that sense, it is not a case of mixing up of religious symbols into civic life, but it is the right of there's the right to live a civic life religious religiously if they want. Uh, this uh, in India, this has happened with this film actress uh, uh, Zakia, I think, who has just uh, you know said, "I will, I will not uh, act in film because I want to go back to my religion." And a lot of people say, "Look, this is this is a religious decision, not a civic decision." Apart from a, being a pat decision through patriarchy, Muslim patriarchy, and so on and so forth. And the Kashmir question is very much there in that because she's from Kashmir. So many, many so as in France, you want to solve it by a definition of secularism or secular, or which, 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 is, which is exactly what you're saying, separation, which is not mixture, but separation, just purification, purify civic life of... Interestingly, Ambedkar was very, very attracted to this idea. In, yeah. You know something, I don't know how many people know this, and it's there in very marginal. Ambedkar wanted to do the same thing which Emmanuel Joseph Sears uh, in France instituted, which is a civil service for priests, civil service exam for priests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for, for in, in Sears's case, for Catholic priests in France, Ambedkar wanted the same thing for priests in India. So, so what does that mean? That priestly functions are religious, but the civil service function is not. So in that sense, 
even religious life is not simply separated it must be framed framed in a secular <coughs> ambedkar was, was at that level attracted by these ideas at the same time it's interesting to see that ambedkar was a strong proponent of religion itself as a mode of of social life as a thicker mode of social life than political life because he found political life to be too thin too transient religious life he found far more uh, yeah uh, far more with stronger sense of collective association at the same time he wanted religion to be something which was in a functional sense egalitarian so very close to that one and at the same time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. you were saying something yeah I mean, but on the French question, in the European question, I mean, let me quote Ethio Balibar. I had met him some years back, and Ethio Balibar uh, told me that uh, we were discussing because at that time this was happening, this whole uh, problem. This is many years back, and Balibar he had come to change. You know, so, so, uh, so Balibar, Balibar said that you know it's so much more interesting for to for me to think. Uh, that uh, instead of all people going around men and women in the usual european french clothes no nothing uh, that there are some or many whatever women wearing hijabs and reading voltaire and he saw no contradiction in it he says that a lot of people going around in good reading and doing work on the computer that's one thing but a lot of women or some women wearing hijabs but reading voltaire is to me a much more interesting vision of a society and the alternative i think is can kind of come in